Good afternoon. This is Dyke Hendrickson, and this is Life Along the Merrimack. I am the host of this half-hour program, and it comes about once a week. We talk about life on the Merrimack as it relates to its history and to its health. Frequently, I have guests on the show. Today, I am the guest. I want to talk about a few public events coming up that relate to the river, and then I want to talk about a segment um, that we don't talk about too often, um, which is women in history along the Merrimack River. And I got this idea when I was watching um, a PBS show recently. It was the history of country music. And, you know, for the first, like, 100 years, there wasn't a woman to be seen. Eventually, you know, women came along um, and they became very prominent, Dolly Parton, Emmy Lou Harris, um, many of these people that we've heard of. But they didn't have a big history. Well, that's similar to Newburyport on the river. I want to talk about some of the re- women who were prominent and um, made significant contributions. But first, I'm going to ter- talk about a couple current events. Um, we, d- you know, This community is becoming more interested in the health of the river, and um, I think there's several events this week that are interesting. And, of course, they'll be on YouTube somewhere if you don't get to see them this week. Um, On the subject of um, having uh, books come out, um, and this is a little different from where I wanted to start, but um, I recently got good news. I have a book coming out in March. It's called... um, the um, New England Coast Guard stories, and um, it is, I just got word this week, so that's why I'm a little excited about it. I wanted to share it with you. Um, For the last couple years, I've been going from northern Maine to southern Connecticut interviewing Coast Guard people, so this is titled New England Coast Guard Stories, Remarkable Mariners. It'll be out in March. And I like to think persistence helped out here. Um, I had everything in, the pictures, the captions, all the text. In December, I heard nothing. Um, several times I called and you know, got no response. So I wrote to the president of the organization, the History Press, and I said, did someone die there? I mean, can really everything be finished in December? I never, you know, don't have a date. I don't have an editor. Anyway, within an hour, someone, not the president, got back to me. And um, so I'm very happy to hear that in March, uh, my book on the New England Coast Guard will be coming out. But before that happens, we have um, many things coming along and several of them this week. Um, Here are some events related to the river and its health. Tonight, and it is Tuesday, October 15th, there will be a lecture at the Newburyport Library titled Life and Work on the Merrimack. It starts at 7 and will be presented by Melissa Drake from the Buttonwoods Museum in Haverhill. It will focus on how the river shaped the economic development of the community. Now, in the 18th century, timber was cut and sent down the river. As a result, communities like Newburyport were able to develop many shipbuilding businesses and enterprises associated, such as twine, sails, Uh, steel forging, that type of thing. In the 19th century, um, textile mills, including in Lowell, Lawrence, and Haverhill, harnessed the power of the Merrimack River to develop industries that employed thousands. Uh, This is one of the first great migrations to America when um, people from Europe uh, came and worked in the mills. I think we know that um, Lawrence is called the immigrant city. Lowell has, you know, 50 different nationalities represented there. And so these are um, events that happened um, as a result of those uh, tex- textile mills. And so on Wednesday night, um, there are, so much pollution came of that. Um, and so she's going to be talking about how the river created jobs but caused pollution as well and how we can change it. On Wednesday night, October 16th, there will be a lecture called Nature in Flux, Managing Change at the Parker River National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, Biologist Nancy Paul will speak and will start at 6.30 at the Senior Community Center. 
Um, the event is hosted by Storm Surge, which is a local organization designed to bring attention to environmental changes. On Thursday night, uh, the director of the Better Future Project will speak at the Central Congregational Church at 14 Titcom Street in Newburyport at 6.30. The speaker is um, executive director of that organization, Craig Altermos. He's based in Boston. His subject will be building a movement to tackle the climate crisis. So he goes around and um, talks to different groups, um, talks about the concern, of course, um, of the river, and the Merrimack River is of concern, and I think he has knowledge of the political area. You know, how can, how can people, how can organizations band together uh, to have stronger environmental regulations, to put pressure on local uh, political figures to help out with cleaning the river, and in general, have a force that'll speak up for environmental elements. Now, those in the Merrimack Valley, uh, many are certainly interested in that. Um, we've had a lot of pollution recently um, as a result of CSOs, combined sewage uh, overflows. And that happens when, in a heavy rain, um, the sewage treatment plants in Lawrence and Lowell and Haverhill they get rainwater as well as sewage. Uh, many millions of gallons flow into the, t into the treatment plant and it can't handle it all, so it has a discharge. And that means raw sewage gets into the river. And um, because of climate change, because there are um, a more severe short storms, particularly in spring and early summer, we're getting more sewage and effluent coming down the river. Clearly, Newburyport's at the end of the line, so we're conscious of it. And my guest last week, Bob Cronin, who was a city councilor for eight years and a boater for about 30 years on the river, you know, he confirmed this. I said, you know, Bob, we keep hearing about this, sometimes in the newspaper, sometimes in papers or by speakers. Have you, are you aware of this? And he said, absolutely. My boat's in the Merrimack, and, you know, sometimes it's dirty in the morning. At times you can see effluent. There's a group of us that used to go swimming upriver, you know, at a place they always considered um, quite clean, and this year we didn't do it. Um, we said, you know, I don't want to take the risk of getting in there. So here is a boater who's been on the Merrimack for 30 years saying, yeah, it's getting bad. So that is um, one thing you can go to Thursday night um, at the Congregational Church at 14 Titcom and learn about organizations that are working for better environmental conditions. Uh, all those three events are free. On the subject of meetings and community involvement, I noticed that it appears city leaders are pushing back a little bit on developer Stephen Karp's plan to build Waterfront West along the river. Karp, of course, um, is a nationally known builder, and he owns the most commercial property in Newburyport. Um, those holdings include five acres along the river between Michael's Harborside and the Old Black Cow. Um, Carp's plan is to build about 200 condos on that property. Um, and if he makes money, if once things are going, he says he might build a 80 to 100 room motel on the property. His company, New England Development, is also planning retail stores. I had to laugh. I, I'm a former reporter for the Daily News here in Newburyport, and I remember uh, when it, this plan came out two or three years ago, um, people were so-so about the condos, and they thought, wow, a motel might be a good thing because we have a couple inns in town, as you know, but we don't have a motel um, that is near the water. And for instance, if you have a wedding party or a funeral, which and you need you know eight or ten rooms suddenly um, to put in and, and make part of your social plans, we don't have that kind of thing. So the thought of a motel was interesting to a lot of people, but later it came out that well, once the condos are well underway or finished, then we'll consider building that uh, motel. So suddenly. Um, it wasn't quite as appealing. 
And early on, as I say, two or three years ago, the early pup reaction seemed to be, well, he owns a property, he can build there. But many residents seem to be objecting to that now. They say 200 condos and perhaps 180 hotel rooms is too dense for that parcel. Also, there's some who doubted that retail can survive there. First of all, we have many, we have many stores in downtown Newburyport, and um, a lot of people don't want them to have more competition. They have trouble enough staying in business. But beyond that, um, I was at one of the hearings, and they had a specialist that the city hired, by the way, who said, look, don't count on retail stores in the future. Th I think we all know that... You know, online buying is increasing at a tremendous rate. And so for you to think that you know, over the next 5 to 15 years, these retail stores are going to thrive, that is not correct. We see much less retail purchasing in stores and much more online. So I thought that was interesting. Actually, Mr. Karp uh, spoke to the Newburyport Chamber of Commerce last week. And he, he, he was uh, candid about one thing. He said, I have to have density to make money on these condos. In other words, he wanted a lot of condos to, you know, to make a lot of cash. He is going to have, have some open land there, a park, and I think the boardwalk will be continued. Um, but this seems to be um, coming at a time when a number of public officials are, are showing concern. Um, they feel their goal is to protect the city, and this is their one time to do it. So the planning board, along with the city council, um, decided to look at the ordinance again, the zoning ordinance, um, and perhaps um, make it tighter, perhaps have it allow fewer condos, perhaps have a, an element that makes sure that they provide adequate parking. It was kind of curious when someone criticized the car plan for not having enough parking spots that the zoning ordinance required. He said, well, a lot of people have Uber and Lyft these days. They don't drive cars so much anymore. I had to laugh at that one. I mean, I mean to think that... <clears throat> Um, you know, we're going to change to Uber that fast and, you know, leave your car at home in Newburyport or in, you know, Lexington or Haverhill and take a, an Uber. I found that a little difficult. Um, but city officials are looking closely at that now. <clears throat> also, I think they're looking at the fact that this is low-lying area. Um, storm Surge, which we mentioned before, is an organization that talks about what if. Uh, what if we have a big storm? What if we do have sea rise and river rise? Um, it could flood that area. And in fact, the city, under Mayor Donna Holliday, has a resilience committee, um, a committee set up to make plans for the day that we might get too much rain or too much flooding. So it's curious that this enormous um, residential area is going to go into a low-lying part of the river. So these are things that um, city officials are starting to look at in a new light. Um, it reminds me of um, a development four or five years ago that was projected for uh, property owned by the Newburyport Redevelopment Authority. This was downtown, um, right next to the... Um, the parking lots in the downtown and where the firehouse is, there's about 4.2 acres, which was owned by the NRA. And they made a deal with a developer in Rhode Island to build condos, build some stores, um, build some, you know, they'd have a park as well. But this was going to be, <clears throat> you know, dozens and dozens of condos. And I think the key was this was public land. And so many people said, why, why are we giving away public land to, for more condos that known from Newburyport's going to live in anyway? So Mayor Donna Holliday, who is a very capable mayor and very aware of feelings in the community, um, hosted what she called a charrette. Now, this is not charades, although um, there might be some connections there, but this was a community meeting, and it was set up to hear 
uh, different views on this. So it wasn't a public meeting where people stand up and I think I like this, I don't like it. It was um, at a, one of the local churches in the recreation room and um, it was based on asking uh, questions of what do you like about this? What do you really want for the downtown area? What do you want done with this open land? And um, about 110 people came. Again, I'm a former reporter for the Daily News, so I covered it. And um, more than 90% of the people said, we really don't want this. This is public property. You know, they don't make waterfront um, anymore, like the, the, um, the phrase goes. And so it wasn't voted down per se, but this charrette did elicit the fact that people did not want building on this public land. And uh, Mayor Holiday, you know, pulled back and basically said that people don't want this. Now, and so it was never built. And as a result, a partial result, um, they're taking parking off the waterfront as we speak, and they're going to put more parkland in there. So the charrette, you know, had a reason. It, it did to exist to hear what people had to say, they said it, and so as a result, we don't have condos, but we have a new park coming. We're losing a lot of parking spots, if, if you haven't noticed yet, along the river. But these things do happen. So anyway, those are some of the things. The big difference is um, that was public land with Waterfront West, the CARP development. That's private land. So we will see how that all develops. But right now, it seems like um, the city... Um, the council and zoning board members are taking another look at it and seeing if that's the best way to do it and certainly wondering about a density where there would be 200 or more condos coming in and uh, would there be parking, would it take away from the city's quality of life, that type of thing. So I just wanted to say those things and now I'm, you know, I wanted to talk a little about um, women in history. And again, as I say, I saw this, a very good program, uh, PBS program on country music. There are no women until recently. And that's kind of the way it was in Newburyport, at least the written and, and um, calculated word of our history. Um, women, say from 1635, when Newbury was created, and then in 1764, when Newburyport the watersiders um, created their own community. Obviously, women have always had a good and great role. Um, sometimes you know, they had to keep the house going. They had to um, have the children educated. They had church responsibilities. But in terms of professional life, as we see today, they didn't have so much of um, a place. And so in my book, one that I wrote some years ago called Nautical Newburyport, I did have a chapter on that. It was called, Now Let Us Praise Famous Women. And so I wanted to read a little from that and mention eight or ten women who we usually don't hear about, um, but uh, were central to history and, um, you know, are valuable that we know about it. Um, Newburyport has had strong, capable women since well before its inception in 1764, but the greatness is not easily documented because most are not in the history books. Certainly one of the strongest attributes was coping. Hundreds of husbands, brothers, and fathers were lost at sea, and countless numbers uh, of women had to make do after their breadwinners disappeared. In this nation's early years, women were not part of the history of Newburyport, or any other community, at least by historians that worked at the time. And one example I think of uh, was in, in the mid-1852 uh, era. Um, fishermen always went out um, some two to five miles and came back at night. Others would go out for a few days. And they would go north and east, uh, sometimes very far away. And in 1852, there was a very large st storm called the Yankee Gale. And um, boats from all parts of the North Shore were caught out in the gale, could not get back to land. And it was re later recorded that 92 vessels, fishing vessels, from the North Shore were lost. 
and 24 of them were from Newburyport. So you can just imagine the terrible moment and the terrible difficulties that the women of the family were suddenly faced with, the mother, the wife, the sister. The ship, you know, their, their vessels were lost. They were, were never found. Um, and this happened frequently. Um, on a larger scale, uh, ships were lost off of the coast or on their way down past South America with regularity. Many ships uh, never came back. So women had a tough time. But that being said, there were several women who, um, you know, do remain, their names are in our history today, our lexicon of women. One of them is Anna Jakes. Of course, we've heard of Anna Jakes Medical Center. She lived from 1827 to 1911. And her generosity um, marked the beginning of Anna Jakes Hospital. Um, and she, as the story goes, that in about 1881 or 1882, she, um, Anna Jakes, was a single woman, a lifetime resident of the area, and she gave $22,000 to get a clinic slash hospital started. Now, $22,000 was a lot of money then. I mean, it's a lot of money now for me. It's an enormous amount. But, you know, it's probably perhaps worth $2 million in today's uh, money. But she was generous. Um, she inspired others to give money. And the first Anna Jakes Hospital was built in about 1882. We've seen it grow. And it's an exciting thing. We have a great hospital now. Anna Jakes was a key element of that. Another uh, name that does resonate even today is Emma Lander Andrews, who was a teacher of Johnson Grammar School on Hancock Street. And she was a co-founder of what was then the South End Reading Room. She lived um, about a century and a half ago. And she led the drive to provide families in the South End with reading materials. In 1905, a house at the corner of Purchase and Marlborough Streets was purchased. As Andrews' health deteriorated in the 1920s, uh, the reading room was transferred from her possession and became a branch of the Newburyport Public Library. So we've probably heard of the Emma Andrews Library. It's still there in that wonderful residential section on Marlborough Street. I love to go there myself. And <clears throat> she was the one who got that started. Here are a few other women who um, may not be very well known, but I just like to get their names out there so um, we, we can just say, well, we're doing our best to find out women's good influence. Jane Andrews, um, from 1833 to 1887, was an educator and author. Um, she, was, uh, she opened one of the first city's girls' schools in a family home at 188 High Street. She published several volumes of children's stories, including The Seven Little Sisters Who Live on the Round Ball That Floats in the Air. That was in 1862. So that sounds like a good text. Minnie Atkinson. Uh, we have Atkinson Common here. We used to have Atkinson Lumber. Uh, she lived 1868 to 1958. She was a journalist and author. She is known for her book Newburyport in the World War, and this is World War I, which discussed the community's contribution to the World War I effort. She also wrote a text entitled A History of the First Religious Society in Newburyport. And her grandfather was the founder of Atkinson Coal and Lumber, and she also wrote for the Newburyport Daily News. So she was active. She wrote a couple books. Uh, she was a journalist and author and uh, from one of the lead families of that period of time. Elizabeth Bray has gotten attention recently. She was a diarist and world traveler. And in 1854, she boarded a boat captained by her husband, Stephen Bray. Now, women did not go on boat, ships in those days. There were a few, such as Elizabeth Bray. But, you know, today, of course, we have the Coast Guard, which is replete with women. 40% uh, of the Coast Guard Academy's uh, freshman class this past year were women. And there's 6,000 women in the Coast Guard. So women are getting on ships nowadays, as can be said. But at the time, it didn't happen. But 
she was adventurous. Her husband um, evidently uh, enjoyed her company, and so she um, went on several long trips. One of them that I recall in about 1854, she boarded a vessel with her husband. She left her two sons on the pier. They were 11 and 10, and they were going to stay with an aunt and an uncle, and they didn't become homeless. But she took her five-year-old daughter, Fanny, and Fanny later wrote about it and became quite an author. But I just thought of that moment for those young boys. Oh, gee, the parents are leaving, my sister's leaving, and they were gone for more than two years. And the Maritime Museum here in town, of which I am the outreach historian, recently had a play about that. Um, there are a couple other names that you might hear and at least... Uh, know about Hannah Colby Fowle, 1838 to 1929. She was one of the first businesswomen of the day. She owned uh, what was known as Fowle's Market, no, Fowle's Store at 17 State Street. Now, there is a Fowle's Market on High Street, but this is on State Street. It had a soda fountain, and it sold a variety of newspapers and magazines. And those, you know, who remember the 80s and beyond that, until about 10 years ago, remember, there were a lot of magazines at Fowles. That's on State Street. So that was Hannah Colby Fowl. Um, another woman who sailed was Mary Newton Graves, sailed with her husband, Captain Alexander Graves, on many journeys. In 1860, they went to Liverpool, encountered a severe storm, and the captain was disabled. History has it that after 10 years at sea, Mary Graves was able to take control of the ship, and she brought it safely into port. So there's a woman coming to a good aid in a tough period of time. Dar Dr. Abby Noyes Little lived from 1872 to 1952. She was the only physician in Newburyport to go abroad for service in World War I. Uh, there were others. One of my favorites is Euphemia Vale Smith. She was a local historian known as Mrs. E. Vale Smith. In 1854, she wrote the text, The History of Newburyport, from the earliest settlement in, the country, in this country to the present. I, I've used that book many times for my writings, and she did a terrific job. Um, Martha Wheelwright is another woman who we might remember, 1804 to 1888, she was a philanthropist and longtime supporter of the Society for the Relief of Aged Females. Now, there is a vest, uh, big house on High Street until about a decade ago was known as the home for aged women, and she had started it. It lasts more than a century. That organization still exists. Uh, they still help women in need. Um, at this particular point, though, they don't own the building anymore. But I think that's, you know, a wonderful thing that a woman did start that and it still continues even now. We've had several mayors who were women, Lisa Mead, Mary Carrier, Donna Holliday, and, Donna Cl and uh, Mary Ann Clancy. So we've had four women as mayors. And the one thing, another thing, and I know our time is ending, uh, which is too bad because I actually have more women I can talk about. Um, it was in 18, about 1856, Newburyport became the first um, city in the country to have public education for women. Now, there were schools that taught French and, you know, horseback riding and whatever, but they were private. And there were other elements, um, schools. But this, in Newburyport, it was the first one where um, town leaders voted to have tax money go to a school for girls. And from 1856 to about 1868, it was a school right on Washington Street. And uh, many girls, in fact, there, I have a photo in one of my books that show about 30 or 40 girls outside. This was the first one in the country. That's pretty exciting. So women have done a lot of things here. Um, uh, that girls' school, by the way, uh, was closed in 1868 for consolidation. We've heard that word. And it burnt about two years later. So it's no longer on Washington Street. But it was the first in the country for girls. So those are some of the things that I wanted to bring up. I'm Dyke Hendrickson. I'm the host of Life Along the Merrimack. I'm the outreach historian for the Maritime Museum here in town. And we talk about the history and health of the river. It's been good to 
be able to be here today. We'll have a guest next week. We'll talk more about the Merrimack River. And until then, you know, go down to the river, appreciate it, and uh, it's one of the lifebloods of this community. Thank you.